It is my great pleasure to have you all this afternoon together with us uh, for something that we believe is very important. And it's a new e-learning course on agricultural risk management for development. You will hear all from these courses uh, soon. So let me uh, just uh, give immediately the floor to the Assistant Director General for the Program Support and Technical Cooperation Department of FAO, Roberto Ridolfi. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, dear Marcella. Distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome everyone. This is another example of this multi-party cooperation and uh, with the technical expertise of IFAD, FIO, the European Commission, Agent Francaise uh, du Développement, the Italian Directorate General for Development Cooperation, KFW, BMZ, and the new Partnership for Africa Development, NEPAD, all these partners are contributing and converging in building uh, this uh, agricultural risk management for development. I invite all of you strongly to take this course. How many of you have already taken the course? Of course I am lying, <laughs> but this is for the purpose of communication. So I think uh, we, but uh, I would like to con congratulate Claudia. <laughs> Excellent. Extreme weather conditions, pests and diseases, market uncertainty, but I would add a list which is very, very long here. Uh, market access, uh, difficulties to access finance, uh, problematic uh, regulatory environment for investors. These are all risks. And risk uh, is the bread and butter of investment, otherwise called as the what can uh, allow or not allow investments uh, to, to happen. The objective of these courses is to bridge the knowledge gap in production, marketing, financial, institutional, and policy-related risks at the farm level, as well as across the agricultural value chain with a holistic approach in developing country context. We have one of the five strategic objectives of FIO is number four, which is about the food systems. I always say in big conference that agriculture sometimes is marginal in the economy of a country. Food is never marginal. F of food for FIO, F of food, in IFAD F is not for food, it's for fund, but F for food in FIO stands for health issues, for environmental issues, for the whole food value chain impacting on the human being as well as on the planet. I would say that uh, investments in the food value chains are crucial and investments in the food value chains must consider the risks related to it. And these risks, when they are not known, by definition they are high. So in risk managing, the lack of knowledge is tantamount to increase the risk. Enormous. You ask investors, would you like to invest your trillions of dollars into Africa? They will say, but we have no data. We don't know. We don't have indicators. We don't have indexes. You know these people in Wall Street sitting behind the five screens in colors, pushing bottoms and moving monies? from one place to another, they need data. Data on risks, weather, production, um, profitability of the food in the value chain and so forth. These courses are targeted to everybody, national policy markers, makers, farmers, organization, operators in the agro-food value chain to transfer skills and competencies to mitigate agricultural risks using concrete tools and strategies. These e-learning courses contribute to the achievement of sustainable development goals 1, 2, and 13, as well as FAO strategic objective 4 and 5. We recognize that mitigating agricultural risks is among the greatest global challenges for this reason. Now, your contribution in this uh, uh, today in the discussion will be fundamental. So I would like to limit my intervention and ask also the panelists to limit so that we have a, as much as interactions as we can. But let me conclude by saying this. 
I moved here from the European Union, where I invented the, the, the biggest de-risking financial operation ever, which is the European Union External Investment Plan, 44 billion euros of de-risking for shifting money where money doesn't go naturally. This is the point. Money doesn't flow naturally in uh, countries which are high fragility, high instability, high problematic political situation, sometimes conflict. Money doesn't go in these places. So you need to push money to go. And to do so, the best we can do is to reduce the risks. In, our, in your respective expertise, you can do a lot to make sure that the risks are addressed and reduced. And, and that reduction is well known to the people. Communication about this is fundamental. Lack of information, as I repeat, uh, is one of the most important factors to be addressed. We are launching a, a, a product in FIO, which is a, a big initiative called AgriInvest. We have been piloting this with uh, DPI. There are people of DPI here? Very good. We are launching this with DPI and uh, a strategic program number four, uh, because the value chain and the investment expertise are a key. But we are associating to this exercise also the private sector partnership uh, in Marcella division with Andrew and, and his team, because we need to plug in uh, these partnerships of ours here in FIO to become operational towards SDG compliance. What do I mean? The future is looking at the food systems with a very, very strong pool from consumers. What are you asking when you go to buy food in a supermarket? You are asking healthy food. You are asking to know where the food comes from, if there is any child labor involved in your food, if there is any land grabbing involved in your food. In a word, if there is the sustainability involved in what you buy in the supermarket. Well, this will become so strong in a few years, not many, that the production, so the value chain starting from the consumer up to the family farmer will be affected. I would say positively, because the trend is towards sustainability. And therefore, you need to invest. The market of sustainability is estimated to be $13 trillion in five years' time. $13 trillion, not only in food, this big market is triggering a new wave of economic development linked to sustainability. That's where you pop in with your risk analysis and capabilities. Reducing the risk is the first step to bring the money. The second step is to transform this money into sustainable investments, creating decent and sustainable jobs. I think uh, AgriInvest is the initiative that will promote this. I'm very happy that NEPAD is associated. It happens that a very good friend of, of mine is, is now the boss of ARC, the, uh, the, the company in, in, uh, in Pretoria, Johannesburg, by NEPA, the dealing with risk, agricultural risk uh, corporation, company, which is, which is exactly mandated uh, to do this kind of action in the financial sector. But the risk is not only financial, and I think uh, this is where the e-learning comes. In fact, the regulatory sometimes is even more important than financial risk. I stop here. I'm sure the, the discussion will be uh, fantastic. We have here experts in partnership, experts in uh, sustainable production, knowledge management, and Christina, who is the animator of this uh, e-learning uh, uh, push uh, by FIO. And uh, I think uh, we are going very far with that, but we won't stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. And please contribute even when I, I go away in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Roberto. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to give the floor to Turaya Triki, who is our direct partner together with Parm in creating these uh, courses. Uh, she's the director of the Sustainable Production, Markets and Institutions Divisions at IFAD. You have the floor, Turaya. Thank you very much, Marcela. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, for two main reasons. The, the first one, beyond actually the fact of being here hosted by FAO, 
The first one is that I personally spent six years of my life working on risk management. So it's a topic that is extremely close to my heart, despite that my career ended up with developer finance, but the two are very closely linked as uh, Roberto has just described. The second one, which is more important, is that this product we are launching today is the outcome of a very um, important teamwork. Actually, it's, uh, it has been done through or produced through a collaborative approach. And it all started actually in 2015 uh, through a workshop involving IFAD, FAO, NEPAD, the European Commission, BMZ, uh, the Italians, and uh, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody, and the French, IFD. So it started in 2015. It was a long pregnancy that lasted five years. But in my own country, we say, which means in English, that good things take time to materialize. So it took us five years, but we are very proud of the final product. And actually, I'm very proud that it didn't end up in, as a report in somewhere in drawer. So Parm and NEPAD made sure that that translates into a very nice e-learning program that is now accessible to anyone who is interested to learn more about the topic. So one could argue, why do we bother about risk management? I think Roberto's uh, 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 speech was a very nice introductory. I think by now we all know that the challenges uh, ahead of us to achieve the SDGs are extremely important. I mean, doubling production output by 2050, uh, making sure that we have nutritious food systems, they have inclusive uh, food systems, the list gets longer and longer. And the, 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 the challenge gets also more and more difficult in a context where we have increasing frequency and severity of adverse uh, climate events. We have hurricanes, we have financial crises like the 2008, we have food price crisis, and these crises translate into risk. And unfortunately, when we speak about risk, we speak about potential losses in jobs, in income, and in prices also pressures infrastructure and production facilities. And all that would translate into further delays or further obstacles to achieve the sustainable development goals. And that's why we need to care about risk management, because by managing this risk, we try to minimize, actually, the delays and put all the chances from our side to achieve the sustainable development goals. So PARM has actually, PARM is the platform for agricultural risk management was launched with the idea of being this global champion of agricultural risk management, to make sure that we stop or we help governments go beyond the simple perception when they invest to manage the risks they face. I remember I joined actually IFAD in October, uh, so I've been here only for six months. One of the interesting stories that my colleague told me that when they started the country assessment for Uganda, they interviewed the government and said, what is the major risk that you are currently investing in? And the government said, of course, it's drought. After they finished their country diagnostic using this holistic approach, they realized it's pest and disease. And this is where you see the value of the work they do. They help governments make more informed investment decisions to prioritize. The second interesting thing that they also do is that they do not look at this risk in isolation because risks are interrelated. So they offer this comprehensive method to look at the different risks because risks sometimes can neutralize each other. Actually, you can have something that is increasing your cost, but something else that is reducing. So they can balance out and you don't need to invest a dime. So using a holistic approach is extremely important to manage this risk. And that's something in IFAD we believe in, and we've been also trying to promote it. So, of course, we don't have food in our uh, world, but we actually, agriculture which, and rural development are at the heart of what we do. We work with small-scale farmers to improve their livelihood, and improving their livelihood means also that we strengthen their capacity to manage these adverse risks. And that needs also to go beyond insurance, because we need to remember that when you manage risk, either you reduce the probability that the event happens so that the person doesn't end up losing his or her house, his uh, storage facility, his land, and his crop, or what we call the loss once the event happened, which is usually done through insurance. So insurance is part of the work that is covered by Harm, but they go beyond, because beyond actually insurance. And that's also, also the beauty of what they do. 
So maybe I don't want to be long because as Roberto uh, said, the, in, the, the, the objective is to have an interactive discussion. Again, I would like to uh, congratulate the team for such an achievement. It was, as I said, a long pregnancy, but always remember that when you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. And that's what we would like to do through PARD. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed to Ryan. Now we're going to have a set of interventions. I'm going to ask all of you to keep uh, to your five minutes so that we will have some time for discussion after that. And it is my pleasure to give the floor to Karima Sherif, who is Knowledge Management Officer at PARM, Platform for Agri Agriculture Risk Management. You have the floor. Thank you, Marcela, for the word. So, dear colleagues, on behalf of the PARM team, I also want to join Turaya's excitement in really being here together to finally celebrate this long uh, efforts that we've been going through th since 2015 and share with you the result of this work done with FAO and NEPAD with the support of the, our uh, partner donors, which is France, Italy, and the German uh, cooperation. As, as mentioned by Turaya, we, we can now agree that um, the failure to ad adequately address risk and the complexity of the risk and interrelation of this risk has, has left many countries behind and, and, and definitely vulnerable. It was in this context that in 2011, during the discussion of the G20 Development Group and Agriculture Group, there was raised the need to um, identify a new approach, a new strategic approach that, was able, that would be able to address risk in a holistic approach and develop a multi-stakeholder partnership, which is the platform for agricultural risk management. The platform for agricultural risk management uh, is hosted by IFAD, and I would like to call it the, the partnership that can connect the dots. Why we say that? Because PARM really works and take the strength from the partnership and the support of all the technical partners, country partners, and the steering committee members and donor members to really bring uh, the knowledge transfer and, and investment in capacity in human capital uh, to strengthen the integration of agriculture is managing into uh, national planning, uh, institutional capacity, and also leverage investment. Um, that's really PARM mandate. So we focus our mandate, and Turaya mentioned some of the key aspects of PARM, is really to bring evidence. So we like to uh, bring together the knowledge and bring together the partners at country level and uh, develop a holistic approach um, methodology that's able to address risk and uh, assess risk in a participatory um, method and prioritize risk with the stakeholders. We uh, undertake uh, this process with the government, with the country government. PARM actually works in eight countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, but the mandate is global. The second pillar of PARM is actually working on um, identifying those tools. So once we assess and prioritize the risk, we then uh, support the government and identif identification of strategies and tools that can address those risks. Third pillar, which is now why we're here today, which is the most important for PARM and also for managing risk, is really the access to information, as uh, Ridolfi mentioned earlier, and the developing of capacity. PARM uh, has developed a strategy at three level that really aims at um, leveraging the potential capacity at, at country level, build local expertise to ensure a sustainable institutionalization of, of uh, capacity at country level. The first level of, of uh, capacity development that we call CD1, it's a, it's a training uh, process that uh, aims at raising awareness and capacity development and give a generic uh, information on agricultural risk management. The target group of this training, which usually is one, two day trainings, are mainly government officials, could be project staff, and we already implemented some of those training in our countries, addressing, um, targeting our country uh, partners. The CD2 uh, level of uh, capacity development, it's a more advanced type of training, and it's a five-day training, and is actually targeting uh, extension services and the training of trainers, which is a final objective to address uh, farmers. We also undertake some of this training, and in this case, we really work um, with the local university and local partners to ensure that the, the actual knowledge and capacity stays in the country and is institutionalized into the university curricula and also integrated into the extension service strategy. 
Some example was uh, done in Ethiopia, Uganda, and Senegal, where we work with the local university. In Ethiopia, we work with the University of Awasa, which developed a five-day training, following our training material and adapting to the context. Um, the interesting part is that this, this course also linked to action plans, so all our trainers um, then have to develop an action plan to then train all the trainers, and in this way we're trying to keep track of the number of people and the cascade effect of the trainings. Third level of, of capacity development training, it's on specific ARM tools, so we developed some training in Senegal, Cabo Verde, Niger, which are linked to the tools that were identified throughout the PAM process. And the training really targets uh, experts and also private sector to also uh, facilitate and, and um, stimulate the investment on those specific ARM tools. Um, the, this e-learning course was, as Toraya mentioned, was uh, actually the curriculum was developed in 2015 through this uh, workshop where all experts, uh, international experts and development partners got together and designed this curriculum. And not only was used for the e-learning course that we're launching today, but PARM used uh, this course to develop this five-day training, the CD2 level training, which is available also online uh, for, for free. And also we develop the CD1 training, which is more addressing also farmers, and there's a farmer's handbook, which is simplified for farmers to use. Um, Your time is up. Yes. I just wanted to say that now the e-learning course will be integrated into the capacity development strategy of PARM. And again, we're really happy to, to try to disseminate this through IFAD colleagues and uh, a country level, also in view of the second phase of PARM, which will just start. And we really want to try to disseminate and, and scale up this knowledge at country level. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Karima. Now let us go to hear from Nepat, and we have uh, Mariam Sumari, who's going to uh, speak with us through video. So can we please load the video? Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Mariam So from uh, the Nepad agency. I am the senior project manager for agriculture and food insecurity risk management. And it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon, even if it is remotely, uh, for the launch of our e-learning course on agriculture risk management. We have been working on this uh, e-learning course for the past three years. So today we are really happy uh, all together to uh, collect the, uh, to harvest the seeds of uh, uh, this uh, work that we have been uh, uh, undergoing for such a long time and with all the efforts that we have been putting into it. Um, maybe the first thing I would like to say is that uh, risk management is a very important area uh, for uh, agricultural development, especially on the African continent, because it is quite new. In Africa, we are not used to manage risk. We are used more to um, uh, manage crisis, running after crisis, but not taking the time to think ahead, uh, to plan, to prepare, and to get ready for um, addressing the risks. So this e-learning course will help us in that specific endeavor of managing the risks instead of managing the crisis. Uh, the second important reason why I think we should be celebrating today is that uh, this e-learning course is very timely. It comes at a time where uh, the NEPAD agency, through the, Afri the Agriculture and Food Insecurity Risk Management Project, is starting implementation of risk management solutions in uh, a number of African countries based on government priorities, but also on the outcomes of the PAM process. Uh, so uh, this is very timely and we will make good use of this uh, um, um, knowledge that has been co-created between uh, um, PAM, uh, FAO and the NEPAD agency. We will definitely uh, support capacity development in all the countries where we are implementing the project especially working with extension services, working with uh, technical services as well as NGOs, but also 
uh, last but not least, the universities and research practitioners. And we would like to particularly emphasize the need to include and involve uh, universities and researchers in this endeavor because they are the one who will definitely institutionalize the uh, learning about risk management and make sure that it is transmitted to uh, the future generations. Uh, last, uh, we need to do more in terms of uh, uh, knowledge co-creation when it comes to agriculture and food insecurity risk management. We need to customize and to domesticate this uh, uh, learning and this knowledge that we have been uh, um, uh, making for the past years. In particular, we hope that two years down the road, we'll be able to co-create and to have an African-oriented uh, risk management tool that will really combine both indigenous knowledge and scientific technological innovation to make sure that we are really addressing the risks in a, a profitable and effective manner. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks go to Marian. Now let's he let us hear from Christina, Christina Petraki, who is the FAO e-learning team leader in the partnership division. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for being here with us. So what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about is um, since we have heard about the, all the various global challenges we have and uh, all the different risks, uh, and since capacity development is at the heart of FAO's mandate, FAO has created the FAO e-learning center. So I would like to talk to you a little bit about that and a little bit about the process that we have followed for the development of these courses. So the FAO e-learning center is a platform that offers free multilingual uh, e-learning courses for anyone <laughs> at any time, anywhere. The idea is to really have a public good available for everyone to basically transfer skills and competences to support countries, but really professionals and policymakers in uh, selecting the most appropriate strategies and policies to face these challenges and these risks. So um, all the different courses are uh, supporting also, of course, the Sustainable Development Goal Framework. And uh, to access them, uh, you, you just have to uh, type in uh, learning at fao.org, so it's quite easy. The courses are organized into uh, uh, various uh, categories, thematic categories. So you have, for example, uh, food and nutrition security, of course, but also food systems, uh, food safety, uh, investments, responsible investments, uh, a number of thematic areas. Uh, and also now uh, agricultural risk management. So this is now uh, the, the new category. Uh, as I was mentioning, uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about the process that we followed. So we have um, um, started a huge collaborative effort with uh, a number of uh, institutions, among which, of course, NEPAD, as mentioned, PARM, which is a G7, G20 uh, initiative, um, but also Agence Française de Développement, the Italian government, um, KFW Development Bank, uh, BMZ, IFAD and FAO, we, uh, we have organized a, a collaborative learning needs assessment to understand what we're, which has contributed to the design of a curriculum. We have also invited, we were about 60 institutions worldwide, uh, development agencies, but also NGOs, universities from the north, from the south, uh, it was really a, a, um, quite a collaborative effort to define the curriculum. What is very important for, um, and what we did during that, that, um, that event is to, uh, we, have ta we have tried to concentrate and anal analyze our target audience groups. So the target audience groups that we have are mainly farmers and farmers organizations, policy makers and government officials, but also the intermediaries. Uh, all these um, basically service providers along the food value chains, which also provide services to mitigate agricultural risks. And we went into a very detailed analysis of their roles, their responsibilities. From there, we extracted their job tasks, 
And from the job tasks, we then derived the knowledge, the skills, and the competences they need to acquire to better. So I, I'm, I'm describing a little bit the methodology to, to, to try to explain that these are competency-based courses. So it's not just transferring content. It's trying to uh, uh, target specific competencies. So um, the objective, as was mentioned before, is to try to uh, develop these skills and competences for all the actors along the food value chain uh, using a holistic approach of risk, as we, w as we heard before, uh, because m very often uh, things are very much complementary and, and, uh, and we need to have an integrated approach to, uh, to this uh, to analyze them, and also to provide concrete tools and strategies uh, for the, these target audience groups. So these are the four courses. I will uh, not describe them in detail because um, actually the main author of the content for these courses is, is here with us, so he will be uh, dealing with us. It's, uh, it's Professor uh, Kisan Kunjal, who is a professor at McGill University and a former FAO colleague and the main author of the courses, so he will be but just to mention that these courses co contribute, as Mr. Ridolfi mentioned, to SDGs 1, 2, and 13, and of course to FAO Strategic Program 5, which deals with um, the increase of re resilience of livelihoods uh, to threats and crisis. Um, so just uh, I I'm concluding by saying that we are also thinking of certification. Uh, so we're working on that. For that, we are going to be using um, an innovative method, which which will be uh, using the digital badges. So it's a, um, it's a, a, a some sort of a, the certification of the acquisition of competences. So the the final test will be scenario based, competency based tests to make sure that people have actually acquired these competences. These badges can then follow you uh, through, your, uh, through Twitter, through your LinkedIn, through your um, profile, and you can, by accumulating different badges, you can basically develop uh, your professional profile. So uh, uh, then you can actually store them uh, on the computer, but also on, on what would they call badge wallet, and which are also visible on your, on your mobile. So this is also uh, to when you want to target a specific professional profile. Uh, so what I'd like to do very briefly is to show you quickly the, the interface, just for you to have an idea of what it looks like. Um, every course always starts with a description of the target audience groups that I already mentioned. Uh, then you have, of course, the introduction uh, to, to the subjects, the, the specific course objectives, the, so the learning objectives and what you can expect to have learned at the end. And then um, a small... Um, a small uh, um, tutorial to guide you in the navigation of the course. And then you start with the content. I wanted to mention also that uh, these courses are uh, developed um, with the support of instructional designers, which are uh, adult learning specialists. And uh, very often uh, in the middle of the courses, you have, of course, interactions, animations, and tests to test your memorization. Um, so, and uh, you can always view the so um, this was just to, to give you an idea. You also have uh, the possibility. And so the, the instructional designers help us a little bit in applying uh, different learning strategies um, to the content. And uh, you can also, of course, uh, navigate the, the course through the, um, the menu, which is here. So you can decide. You can also have additional reference materials, etc. So this was just to uh, give you an idea of what, it, uh, what the course looks like. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to, uh, to thank, I have, I have many, many people to thank, but I would like to thank, first of all, the, the, um, the EFAT colleagues that have contributed, the NEPAD colleagues that were involved since 2015 with us, uh, all the different contributing organizations. And then, of course, I would like to thank you very much for your time and, and, and your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Christina. And uh, now before having a snapshot of the four courses, I'd just like to remind everybody after uh, the snapshot, we're gonna hear from right now, uh, we will have questions and answers. Uh, you'll ask all the questions all you want, all your doubts, and then we will have some refreshments. So please stay with us. Uh, it's my pleasure to give now the floor to Kisan Gunjal to take us through the courses. Thank you very much for, <coughs> for introducing me and inviting me to be here. It's great to be back. Um, 
meeting colleagues and so on, especially um, uh, it was snowing yesterday, I mean last week in uh, Toronto. Yeah. So this has been, a, uh, this has been as, as mentioned, this has been a, a four year project and uh, uh, since the beginning I have been involved with this. Um, my job here is to give you basically a trailer of the movie that is going to be taken or, or seen by many people. And basically what we would like to do is start with a video, <coughs> a brief uh, five minute video which has been prepared uh, by Farm uh, based on the real life experiences of the farmers that were interviewed and the, the, uh, the risks that they face and some of the solutions that they have followed. Yeah, this is an excellent uh, complementary uh, material for uh, the courses that we, we have prepared, especially tools, uh, particularly that even though these talk about very few uh, tools and the, the courses uh, are supposed to provide you a full detail of the, uh, the set of the, the tools. So could we have the, there's a link here, yeah, okay. It's a five minute video. Farmers live with risk and make decisions every day that affect their farming operations. Farmers are frequently exposed to the uncertainties of weather, prices, and disease. Many of them live on the edge of poverty due to strong uncertainties. Farmers do not know whether rainfall will be good or bad over a season. They do not know the prices they will receive for produce sold. The majority of risks are linked to specific stages in the agricultural value chain and can be grouped into weather-related and natural risks, biological and environmental risks, logistical and infrastructural risks, market and commercial risks, public policy and institutional risks, political and security risks. These risks are not under the control of farmers, but some farmers have developed ways of imagining them. My name is Emma. I'm a smallholder farmer. Me and my husband work in the farm. We produce and sell mainly coffee. We had a very bad experience which killed our plants. We found that our plants were getting affected by a fungus that progressively kills the coffee plant. We did not know then that the use of contaminated planting materials and tools could spread the disease even further so. In one year, we lost almost our entire harvest. We could not sell any of the production we expected to have. Every year we rotate within the same garden and where we grow our potatoes one year, we grow maize intercropped with beans the next year. This practice not only keeps the fertility of the soil, but it also controls pests and disease, and it increases yield. Now we are able to save some money. We invest in some poultry and zero grazing units. In dry season, we can still sell our milk, and if we have no milk, we still have some money from our small hardware shop. My name is Ogune. I'm the chairperson of a farmer's association, which is composed of 600 members. We decided to join the association because as individual farmers, we face many challenges, in particular when it's time to sell. We have problems of unstable prices. When prices are too low, farmers do not have the right facilities to store their produce. As an individual farmer, buyers offer very cheap prices. We end up selling our produce at a lower price compared to the bigger market. All these challenges are making farming a very risky business and not commercially viable. Being in a farmer's association has helped reduce a lot of our risks, in particular those related to the market. Members of the association bulk their produce and build a proper warehouse where we safely store our production while a marketing committee go look for a good market and negotiate the best price. As a group, we are able to enter an agreement with bigger buyers and are in a better position to sign contracts and negotiate a more competitive price. We funded SACO where our members deposit a fee allowing them to have savings and access to agri-finance tools. With SACO, our members are able to invest in their production. 
Farmers can do many things to manage their risks. No single tool can cover all. They need to develop an integrated approach for a better risk management strategy. With good information, farmers recognize the advantages and disadvantages of each risk management option. In this context, the role of government is the key to ensure an enabling environment to manage risks. This is part of the holistic approach to agricultural risk management. All stakeholders involved in the value chain are responsible, aware, and empowered to manage their risks. Farmers need to change their perception of risks and approaching farming under a new way of thinking, agricultural risk management. Farmers need to be able to self-assess their risk in order to understand the negative and positive outcomes of decisions taken and better anticipate problems. When farmers are empowered to manage their risks, they are also able to approach the other actors of the value chain as partners. Agricultural risk management can significantly contribute to improving the resilience of vulnerable rural households by increasing their capacity to absorb and adapt to risks. Agricultural risk management is a proactive way of thinking that ensures that farmers and businesses are prepared. Next. Um, we basically decided based on the consultation that was followed that we should cover the entire sequence of the risk uh, management cycle and uh, so the framework that was used was basically starting from identifying different types of risks, uh, doing the assessment of them and then identifying different tools and then implementing and uh, planning and implementing. There is a little bit of um, uh, M&E, uh, but uh, there's not so much uh, emphasis on that. So one of the four courses, the first is obviously to understand the risk in agriculture. And uh, um, in terms of, I will basically cover each of these as what kind of competencies that you will get if you uh, take these courses seriously and, uh, and study. Uh, basically, the learning objectives for this is the what are the different types of risks that you would see and uh, how, how they're defined and what are the concepts and the characteristics and the causes of these risks. Uh, it also, you would appreciate in this that what are the potential implications of risk uh, and to whom and the various stakeholders would be uh, uh, involved and uh, I would also learn about the holistic approach, especially for the policy makers and those who are going to design the strategies. It also would understand what could you achieve from these and in terms of how it could contribute to improved uh, lifestyle. In terms of the uh, risk, as you see, you normally think in terms of the, the two main characteristics that, that what is the frequency of the particular risk event and how severe it is. So um, World Bank and uh, uh, Parm basically have analyzed this in terms of there are some risks that uh, they, they occur uh, very in, uh, frequently, but their impact is very low. So farmers can manage these kinds of risks very easily, pests and uh, diseases, for example, or uh, some of the common ones, bad seeds and so on. So this is a layer one, which is risk mitigation done by farmers. Risk two is, or layer two is, uh, there is a low frequency of this, but have a fairly high impact. And this is where the markets can play an important role uh, in terms of mitigation. And the third uh, layer is basically uh, th th there are disastrous risks. Fortunately, they happen uh, less frequently. But that's where you need the government and other coping mechanisms for this. Just to give an example of some of the types of risks, uh, market risks or price risks, as you can see, um, you know, if you see about a 15, 20 year graph of the prices, monthly prices, you can see very easily some of the key benchmark prices, international prices of the four main staples, um, soybean, uh, maize, wheat, and rice. And you could see a, a big changes, uh, prices from, for example, 2007 to eight, uh, it for rice increase is 232%. Uh, but then you could also see prices going down, uh, which is a risk for farmers. In 12 and 13, for maize went down by 43%. So this is an example of how um, a market risk can be uh, a significant 
the course two is, is an interesting one because that will teach you what are the different types of um, um, methods you can use to, uh, to uh, assess agricultural risk. So this could be quantitative as well as qualitative methods and how to prioritize them. Uh, you would also learn about the process and the outcomes of, uh, of a risk assessment. In other words, the analysis and the synthesis of this. Uh, it, there's interesting uh, section on uh, risk mapping, particularly at the uh, re uh, regional level or community level uh, and at the national level, as well as how to make risk assessment and management capacity profiles, because that will tell where uh, f to the policymakers, where can uh, this kind of capacity exist and how can these be, <clears throat> the risk can be handled. It could also tell you about what kind of key information is, is needed. Just to give you an example of a qualitative method, for example, it could be based on the consensus uh, or so on. Uh, you could classify each risk element in terms of uh, what is the level of frequency uh, from very high to very low, as well as the severity impact uh, from very high to very low. And then given those two characteristics, you could combine them uh, here, they're additively used. But basically, you could have a, a risk that are uh, very high in both, obviously it would be the first priority. So the red color indicates the highest priority and the, the green is the, is the lowest. Uh, you could also have <clears throat> you learn quantitative methods, although there are not uh, many, but there are uh, some where the data exists and information exists. For example, this is the uh, method followed by the World Bank, where you basically look at the negative deviations where the uh, production falls down, that is the risk. When it goes up, it's not a risk for farmers. And so you measure that in terms of a trend, but not just normal trend, but basically adjusted trend saying that well, uh, about a third of a trend of a standard deviation could be declined due to other factors. So the risk is, is measured in, in, in this term. Uh, the third course is the, the crux of it, which uh, we have um, talked about agricultural risk management tools. And this is where people will learn various types of tools. Um, on-farm as well as off-farm tools, as well as um, um, what, what kind of production uh, tools or finance tools, market tools, government support uh, tools that can be described. And, and these also would be where do they apply? Not all of these would apply everywhere and for everyone. Uh, what kind of crops or livestock and things like that would be covered? And there are pros and cons of these uh, in this. So basically, this course, in this course, we have selected uh, 12 different tools. There could be many, and some of these are also grouped, so they could be very specific for uh, specific areas. Uh, the production tools, there are, uh, so in each category, we just, I've selected four, uh, three of them. Production, you could have climate smart agriculture on farm, uh, farmers could practice. Uh, diversification, uh, as well as and, uh, asset and income uh, strategies, and diversification strategy. There are some finance related uh, tools that are agricultural insurance, weather based index insurance, agricultural insurance, uh, finance, and microfinance. Similarly, there are markets related warehouse receipt system, which can also be as a uh, markets as well as a finance related. Contract farming, as uh, the video described, uh, and the commodity exchanges and futures markets, which is, again, it's not applicable everywhere, but these are some of the tools that farmers can, where they exist, uh, apply. And of course, there is uh, coping mechanisms where farmers or the uh, main stakeholders could take advantage of the programs that exist in the uh, public domain, such as the food reserves, disaster assistance programs, and social protection. Basically, each of these follows uh, what is it, what are the concepts, uh, how are they suitable, and their pros and cons, and given examples or case studies, and there's a lot of list of references. So, yeah. And the final course, which is about agricultural risk management strategy, 
policy and mainstreaming, which is sort of the capstone course, which uh, would talk about armed strategies at various levels. You could have uh, farmers. What kind of farmer? Uh, what kind of strategy that the or, or plans that the farmers themselves would have, or at at the farm level. So this could also be looking at from the policy makers' point of view. So they would have a farmer strategies, um, <clears throat> comparing and selecting the risk management tools what tools are needed for what, uh, let's say, agroecological zone or um, and certain areas, explaining the roles and responsibilities of various uh, stakeholders, and what kind of uh, uh, information systems, capacity development, and mainstreaming I is required. Uh, in terms of looking at this, how does it fit together? If we look at the first lesson, which is the, the, the strategy of <clears throat> um, arm strategy, developing and implementing at the farm level, which is a micro. So that would be like selecting risk, tools, consolidating, prioritizing, and arm strategy. The second layer is the, the second lesson, which is how do we combine it or extend that to a community level or a local area level, or in some cases it could be agroecological zones. In, in this uh, part, you could also be talking about what kind of um, training you would need to do a tailor-made for a specific areas, as well as pro-poor advocacy and some of the other topics. The, the third one is the national level uh, strategy, which is basically talking about creating an, an enabling environment, such as the infrastructure, institutions, policies, and regulations and early warning and the information <clears throat> systems. And the finally is uh, how to make this uh, program sustainable. Sustainability of these, uh, which in involves the role of government, uh, capacity development, and mainstreaming. Otherwise, you could have programs made like this, but nobody is taking care of it, so it has to be mainstream. So in terms of what are the key <clears throat> takeaways from this as a concluding one, that these courses, uh, they can be taken, although this is a suit of four courses, they can be taken individually if you're interested in specific aspects, but the whole coverage, all, all four of them would give you a comprehensive coverage of the <clears throat> arm strategy cycle. Uh, this suit of courses also, of course, is the, uh, it provides tools and guidance on how to put together an effective arm strategy. Um, as, to the, the main stakeholders, which are um, from the, um, the entire value chain and beyond, I guess we had to say and beyond because it's not just the people in the value chain, but how does it affect economy in general and, and so on. So this is to help improve the, their knowledge to acquire necessary skills to deal with risk in, in agriculture. And furthermore, uh, I guess this could also be applied, this, given that it is a technical nature of the courses, um, that this could be perhaps more effective in academic settings or um, guided learning settings so that this knowledge is then uh, transferred to the, to the firm level. So any questions and answers, I guess, uh, we follow that. Thank you, thank you very much up. indeed, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much for that, Kisan. And now the floor is open for any of you who would like to ask questions, share comments or thoughts. Um, and I will take several before. And also, please let us know to whom you're directing your question, if it is a question. Yes, please. My name is Henrik. I'm from IFAD. I work in Eastern Southern Africa. And first of all, congratulations to all the partners. It's, it's a great initiative. Um, I had maybe two questions. One is uh, these kind of capacity building uh, programs are often very difficult to, to evaluate and kind of find, see the results and the impact. So I was curious to see in terms of your results chain, how are you measuring uh, sort of outcomes and, and impact of these kind of training programs? And the second one was you were referring at the end towards who is the main target audience and it was basically everybody along the chain, but I think the ultimate targets is really the, the farmers so I wonder if this kind of course, yeah, how, how easy it is for farmers in some of these countries that don't speak English to, to really access these kind of things, and how possibly this could relate to farmer field schools 
and if the idea is really to train more these kind of capacity builders and then how they will use it then to reach out to the farmers. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments at this time? I don't see many, so let us give uh, the floor. Um, who would like to take it? Uh, would you yeah, like to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Yeah, of course, these courses being uh, basically in, uh, online, uh, and you need to be computer savvy, you need to have a computer. So, of course, we uh, are more targeting farmers' organizations or intermediaries like extension officers who would then uh, be our intermediaries to, to uh, transfer the, the, the skills to, to, the, to the farmers. So this is one. Regarding the evaluation, as you know, this is the question <laughs> that is always asked because it's, a, it's, a, it's a also what we try to do is after six months to a year after the promotion and rollout of these courses, what we try to do is to do a, a survey uh, um, uh, to try to assess not only uh, if they like the course, but really if, if they were able to apply in their real life uh, challenges, uh, the, the basically the, the skills and the competences they, they have acquired, and if the, it has made some changes in their, uh, in their life, basically. So this is what we try to do. Uh, maybe Kisan, you wanted to add something? I guess I would only say that uh, in terms of impact, it could also be that some of the material could be made more specific to certain areas or uh, some kind of feedback that would be acquired over the year um, uh, or so. I think that would um, be very useful in our, I, I don't know to what extent whether these are reviewed or uh, some of the changes can be made, but that's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe I can add something, and as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, PARM has tried to adapt this curriculum to a more farm level approach, and we developed that CD1 that I mentioned training courses, which is actually hard copy, so printable, and a really mainly visual images, that very little text, but it still needs an, uh, I mean, an advanced type of farmers, but, but that could be also uh, a way to, to, and then in PARM Horizon 2, we really want to work more so that I mean, to try to, which was the biggest challenge, how to reach farmers. So that, that's one. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Nordin Nasser. I am uh, plant production and protection in uh, sub-regional office uh, FI, FAO in North Africa, based in Tunis. Uh, thank you for this uh, very important, really, courses. And I saw that there is uh, about 100 courses here, from 35 minutes to 31 hours. Yes. Uh, how can we inform in the regions about these uh, important uh, uh, courses? because really we need uh, to uh, enhance capacities in the regions and uh, how can we launch these courses in the, in the region. And I may support uh, uh, to organize something like uh, what we have uh, now in uh, Tunis or in uh, sub-regional, uh, uh, in the Maghreb region between FAO and IFAD. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Well, I believe that, uh, first of all, all of you here could have a role to play in the dissemination, but I think that in this case, the FAO representatives also have a very important role to try to increase the uptake at national level, to inform our also our colleagues uh, in the countries and also all the other affiliates uh, uh, in the countries. But your your proposal is very well, well uh, very welcome. Uh, in fact, we will be uh, keeping in touch because we really need the support uh, in the countries uh, to also try to sensitize and raise awareness for people who, who could uh, directly uh, benefit from these resources. So, and maybe I'm well, I uh, uh, believe that this is the uh, 
time, as Christina says, to, to help disseminate. At the time being, we have around 500,000 users for around the world uh, in the, for all of the courses that you have there. Of course, the ones that we're launching today uh, don't have the users yet. Uh, but, uh, and we're con continuously increasing. Last year, we had 450,000. So now, with 500,000 users around the world, uh, this includes a number. We do it also through our partners. Uh, like, for example, the International Federation of the Red Cross uses the e-learning courses for their own staff. Uh, the EU uses the courses also for their own staff development, uh, um, capacity development needs. And, um, and um, but of course, uh, they're useful only in as much as they are known. So as Christina said, it's really important to help uh, disseminate, uh, to uh, send the message. Uh, very important also are uh, our university partners. Uh, through our university partners, we uh, usually, when we sign partnership agreements with universities, universities we ask them to help disseminate the e-learning courses as part of the um, work plan that we have uh, with the universities. So um, that is, uh, that's, uh, I think that's a really important point, and uh, if we want uh, to have, uh, say, launches in the regional offices, sub-regional offices, of course, um, they're very, very welcome, and we can uh, mm. be there to support. Yes, so far we have worked with three uh, types of partners, so mainly the UN, oh, basically a lot of the UN agencies, sister agencies are already using our courses, but also uh, NEPAD is now uh, starting to use it, um, as, as Marcela mentioned also, but, uh, in, in International Federation of Red Cross, uh, Roof Forum, uh, but also we're working, so the second type of, of partners are universities and university networks. We have created a number of masters and advanced degrees um, in which the courses were directly integrated. Um, and so uh, on food law, masters on uh, governance, etc. And the third uh, big partner for the dissemination that we use are CSOs and NGOs. We're working with a number of humanitarian NGOs but who are using them specifically for their own staff, so to basically develop the capacities of their own staff. But uh, so far it's 500,000, but for sure with your help we could reach bigger numbers. So what's the ne next target? One million. <laughs> Good. Do we have any other? Yes, please, Paolo. Can we have the red microphone on, please? Hello? Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you. I'm Paolo Silveri, lead regional economist in uh, Latin America and Caribbean from IFAD. Thank you again for the presentation and for the initiative. Uh, congratulations to our PMI colleagues and all the other partners involved, <coughs> FAO and, and uh, the EU and others. Uh, thinking of partnerships again, um, it came to mind as, as part of your discussion and also as part of our experience as operational staff, you know, how beneficial it would be to dissemination, uh, the connection with the, with the um, agriculture extension services uh, in country. I was thinking of Embrapa in Brazil, for instance, or INTA in Argentina, or uh, INDAP in Chile. You know, uh, if, you, if you manage to uh, introduce this module in uh, a number of, uh, um, national uh, extension service uh, training facilities and training curriculum, you would uh, scale up to the several millions very quickly, in fact. And another idea that was suggested by my colleague, regional economist from Asia, sitting on my side, is to uh, go through uh, farmers' organizations as well, which is something that we uh, regularly do. And in fact, at the moment, we are organizing at IFAD a number of regional fora to uh, involve uh, cooperatives and farmers associations in our planning and strategic planning uh, processes and also in our investment projects. 
and as many of you know, we're going to have uh, a World Farmers Forum in February next year together with our governing council, as we usually do. And therefore, you know, those are all opportunities to involve uh, farmers' organizations. I can think of CONTAG. CONTAG alone, still in Brazil, has 9 million affiliates. So there is a number of associations that can mobilize lots of people, and you could trigger very uh, high figures of outreach very quickly. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paulo. Uh, that's indeed. So we will have uh, maybe a showing, a demonstration of the courses during the next uh, Farmers Forum at IFAD. That could be an idea. And then, of course, we count uh, upon all of the partners. And uh, this, uh, this, uh, for this set of courses, uh, we have had many partners, as we have heard in the day of today. So we count on all of the partners to help from their own perspectives to do uh, the dissemination through your own networks, through your own um, uh, stakeholders. I don't see any more requests uh, for the floor, so I'd just like to uh, thank you all very much for your participation today. I think that uh, we have in our hands uh, something that can be extremely useful uh, for the future of agriculture uh, because uh, risk is a massive problem in agriculture and usually the problem is that it is um, the burden of risk falls entirely on the smallholders. Uh, it is the smallholders who in the end carry a big uh, part of, uh, of the burden and they don't have the means to uh, uh, make front to the, that risk. So uh, by uh, doing this kind of effort through um, through these e-learning courses, what we are contributing to is creating the capacities, developing the capacities, supporting the capacities at country level that will ultimately create resilience because capacities are uh, contribute directly to uh, local resilience. And then hopefully uh, through this channel, we will help to uh, address some of these risks. Um, and very specifically to manage risks before they uh, become crisis as our colleague from Nepad said uh, today, which I think is quite important. Uh, you may know that yesterday and the day before yesterday, uh, the Global Food Crisis Report was launch launched in Brussels, and that report says that there are currently 113 million people in acute food crisis. It is not talking about hungry people who we know are 821 million. Here we're talking about people in acute food crisis, 113 million. Well, um, before uh, these situations come to that level of crisis, there's many, many risks that made those crises happen. Uh, we know that hunger is increasing for two main reasons. One of them uh, is because of conflict, and there's a lot of risks there. And the other one, and uh, also conflict many, ha many times has problems related to m natural resources management. And the other one, of course, is climate change. So again, if we are able to manage risks in a better way, hopefully we are going to be uh, avoiding the situation of crisis, at least contributing uh, to that. I heard uh, from uh, several of you that, of course, these courses has, have taken their time to be developed, and I liked uh, what you said uh, in terms of uh, a good gestation time means that the product is going to be very good, and I fully agree with that. I also think, and I agree with what was said, that the course, uh, these courses are very timely. Um, uh, it is, they come at a, very, uh, at a very important time in our process towards uh, the SDGs. I think they will be making an important contribution to SDGs 1, 2, and 13, uh, but I think uh, several other SDGs 2, because of their holistic approach, uh, because of their, uh, what happens in the rural areas usually have to do <laughs> with many of the other uh, SDGs uh, 2 but contributing to risk reduction is going to help all of the different aspects uh, that are um, uh, creating ob obstacles for uh, rural development. So, um, uh, and eventually we want to arrive at measuring impact. We're not there yet. As Cristina said, we do have an idea of how all of our 500,000 users, not all because they don't all respond to the service, but we do want to know from them how useful these courses are. There's not really impact measurement, but at least we have an idea of you know, where we're going towards 
uh, with uh, with these courses. So next steps, with the help of everybody, to have a really good dissemination, including I think the idea of uh, going to the extension uh, institutions at country levels is a very important one, and then of course all of the different stakeholders and networks in all of the different fora, including in the IFATS um, forum, Farmers Forum, uh, next time it's there. So thank you all very much uh, for your participation and thank you very much for the contribution of these courses. Um, those uh, long years of preparation of involving stakeholders, what you saw in the video are concrete cases of actual people who have lived through this kind of risk. Uh, so all of these people have been involved and they have helped the creation of these courses with their knowledge. So thanks uh, go to all of those who were involved uh, throughout the process, including the farmers from whom we saw in that uh, very, very nice video. Thank you to all and help us disseminate so uh, we contribute effectively to reducing risks in the rural areas. Thank you very much. And please now is the time for refreshments. Please don't run out. Uh, we can continue the discussion at refreshments, which are where? Just here, outside the library. Outside right outside the library.